Welcome to a Fractured Mind, a discussion on racial trauma. My name is Jennifer. I'm the owner of Aon Counseling and Consulting, and I want to introduce you to some cool people that I've met along the way uh, who are going to share some experiences, and maybe it's going to be a good conversation. We don't know. But um, Adriana, Adriana Paz, she, I met her as an activist and an incredible mom, and I can't wait to hear her experiences. Then we have Juan Colón from Puerto Rico Resistencia. Uh, again, another historian and activist from Puerto Rico. Joining us all the way from, where are you exactly? San Juan. Perfect, amazing, international, kind of. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. Then we have Marvin Hippolyte. Thank you so much for being here. Another incredible activist, specifically for Lynn and Salem, for those of you who are following. Uh, and we also have Jeff Cohen here today, my partner in crime, you could say, sometimes. <laughs> and uh, incredible activist, in second generation incredible activist. This is in his bloodline. Uh, he's the co-chair of the No Place for Hate Committee. Uh, he's a member of Project Out, and he's the vice, vice chair of the Sustainability Committee in Salem. And so we have quite a team here today. So thank you for being here, number one. But also we want to talk about racial trauma and healing. So let's start with what is trauma? In fact, what do you guys know about trauma? What are some of the things that you've heard? What, what's on TV usually about it? I mean, I guess I'll go first. Uh, I mean, what I know about trauma is that it can uh, last with you forever. Um, it's some of the things that just scar you. Some people deal with it better than others. You know, it can change your personality, cause you to act out in certain ways. And, I mean, that's really what I understand about it. Pretty much. I mean, from a clinical standpoint, it's any any activity uh, or circumstance that you can be in. Some can be traumatic uh, for everyone, like being in a car accident, usually very traumatic, but sometimes going through a particular breakup can also be considered dramatic, uh, traumatic, not dramatic. Unless it was very dramatic and traumatic, that's fine too. Uh, so things that usually are included with trauma, hypervigilance, sleep disturbances, number one, uh, increased startle, those types of reactions. And I think that the reason we called this meeting as almost as an emergency. So thank you so much for everyone who last minute was able to make it and, and get it together with Zoom. Uh, we're gonna be answering questions on the channel comments and the Facebook page comments. So please ask away as, as we go. We'll get to them when we get to them, even if it's after the show. But Basically, we're looking at racial trauma specifically for not just the overall pandemic that we're going through right now, which we had already talked about that in our last podcast, which it should be starting kind of like this week when it really starts to magnify the symptoms for everyone. But now we have an extra layer of trauma where we've been watching these videos for the past several weeks of black men being killed and what does that mean to each of us? So uh, this collective complex trauma is getting worse. And I know from the mental health side of things, uh, the pandemic plus bl police brutality is, is a perfect mixture of a disaster. So let's try to heal it. But what do you guys, um, you know, what in your experience, what has been going on with trauma around you right now online in your life? I think it's just the anger, the the not knowing how to physically um, take care of this, right? Um, you're going through the motions, you're isolated, and feeling like, how how do you deal with this? How what can you do? We couldn't do a lot, or felt like we couldn't do a lot when things were normal. Um, what can you do in the midst of a pandemic? Right. 
what can you do? What should you do? If you do anything at all, are you going to get yelled at for that too? Has that happened to anybody, anyone other than Jeff and myself? Has that ever happened? Well, not yelled at, but I think there's other ways of being verbal assault. Hmm. Um, definitely. Are you talking about like protests in Puerto Rico or uh, just hmm. behaviors that you're seeing around you? Because I'm, I'm seeing people becoming verbally assaulted with each other, just like at the grocery store. Just like, oh, Thank yeah, you. there's there's a lot of uncertainty. People are hostile naturally when they're in uncertain territory. Nobody knows what's gonna happen tomorrow. Nobody knows what's gonna happen a week or even a month from now. And that was just normal throughout the whole pandemic. Now that we have the whole riots going on, then it's just aggravated. Now everybody's completely uncertain of the future. We're probably gonna see a rise in COVID cases mm. or as of what it is, and nobody yeah. knows what we're going to be able to do about it. Government response has already been awful, so with the spike in cases. Right, and then also the uh, the beautiful tweets talking about like, if you go out and do anything about it, we'll shoot you. I feel like that's a nice message. Mm -hmm. That's a nice message for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, we're here to talk about healing pretty much and what does healing look like? I know we had recently posted some information about healing and what people expect versus then how it actually, what it looks like. Uh, people think that healing is like meditation and mm. breathing. And that's a part, I mean, that's certainly a part of it. Uh, but I, I know from a social justice standpoint, it requires a little bit more. And for those of us, uh, because we're all kind of activists, our self-care and our, our healing activities are should look a little different, particularly as people of color and who and who also have an intersectionality of different issues uh, that come up when it comes to hatred, right? Once you hate one thing, you can hate anything. You have hatred in your heart. So uh, one of the recommendations was to unpack trauma. I think that's kind of what we are doing right now i think just getting together and thank you so much for being here for this uh, and being willing to talk about this because that's not something that everyone is willing to do even if they're activists at the end of the day uh but as far as healing does anyone have recommendations about what you've been doing for yourself i'm going to give some some tidbits also but i wanted to hear what has been the most healing and soothing for you guys in this process Um, so I don't think healing is what I, I seek at the moment. I don't think that's something that will occur until we address the situation that's called causing the trauma. Um, but what's kept me, um, from kind of exploding is talking more and being more honest about what I'm feeling at the moment with people, with, with fellow people of color, right? I, I no longer occupy my time trying to, or at least try to not occupy my time educating people, or explaining things. I'm looking for people who have the same shared experiences and talk to them honestly and openly. Having those safe spaces to talk. That, that's been like the best thing for me the last couple of weeks is being able to just say what I have to say and not worry about the people I'm saying it too because they all feel the same. They are all walk, walking the same path. Right. That's I'm kind of with uh, Adriana. Uh, I agree with what you said, and especially about the healing. Um, I don't, you know, I think that's uh, abstract to me. Um, in the toolbox that you sent out, Jen, it talks about managing this process and. Uh, for me, I think of two different ways to do it. Uh, one is, uh, what can I do? You know, how can I use my privilege? What can I do to be a co-conspirator, you know, help people empathize, you know, maybe trying to listen more, relax more, so I can focus on what's in front of me. Uh, but the other thing is, uh, you know, maybe it was easier before the pandemic with the virus, 
uh, you know, we all need to find our safe space. And for me, it might have been hanging out with friends in person, or I'm a sport. I'm obsessed with sports. I don't. I can't watch my sports anymore. You know, and uh, just something where I can, I can put myself in a place where it's just me and something else, and not the world. You know, being part of that. So and I do agree so with rough. that. Yeah, no, that, I think that's tough. That's tough because it's how do you disconnect from everything that's going on right now? It's, I almost feel like if I disconnect, I'm going to miss out on something amazing. No, I agree. But I, I actually feel like in some ways, you know, we never want something good to come from something bad that's happened. Unfortunately, that seems like the only way, at least in our society. So I'm just saying that, you know, it's it's been more about uh, connecting with uh, people um, that either know more than I do or are uh, people that you can count on, you know, just uh, in a, in a, in a personal way, you know, that you can be in a room with or be on a zoom call or a phone call with, and you don't even have to say anything. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, that, that I look at it like managing uh, this process. That's a good point, actually. And you're right. Like, how can we heal from something that we're still going through? <laughs> uh, great point. I think uh, just to speak to that a little bit, you're absolutely right. We should pivot then into how to, how to manage it, not heal necessarily. We're not going to heal for a very long time, Adriana. You're absolutely right. Uh, the stuff that I saw just in the past two weeks is I mean, this was this was next level stuff that you usually see in the movies when it's fake. Um, but now we have it on camera. Uh, I think that I've been seeing a lot of groups pop up online and especially mutual aid groups that keep supporting each other around food, necessities, anything, even if it's just listening. Wonderful people are getting together even if it's virtually, it doesn't matter as long as you reach out. I know we were talking about this a, a few weeks ago and how, you know, rates of self-harm and, and folks attempting against their lives are right now on the rise. And that's uh, kind of a sad reality of everything that's happening. Remember, there's a lot of collective grief. A lot of us have lost people that we love to this process um and then now to just add a little insult to injury now we're just killing people for no reason it's not even the virus which is ridiculous um i know we've been so obviously we're having conversations unpacking the trauma some people avoid trying to look at the material i kind of disagree with doing that because i feel like by watching it you're okay, we're recording again my apologies. Uh, what happened at the grocery store? Oh, I was followed. Um, some guy decided to follow me around, looking at me like I was some kind of alien. Uh, I have no idea what was going on. Everybody had their masks. I had my mask. Decided to follow me and, you know, from afar, stare at me. And that was it for me. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna pay the extra money and order my food. I'm not dealing with this. Yeah. And um, the crazy part is that, that ha that's a twofold issue, right? Mm. Just because you have darker skin and you also happen to be a female, what I, was it a male who was following? Yeah. Oh, I wonder why. Yeah. I yeah, wonder. older white male decided to follow me every aisle I went into. Um, yeah, so I was just like, you know what, I'll just pay the extra money and have everything sent home. Yeah, I wasn't going to deal with it. Uh, re returning to our to where we were, we were talking a little bit about healing and how to manage not heal necessarily just yet. Uh, but how do we get there? Right? What's what's that process going to look like? How do we get all the way to a point where we can say like, okay, I feel better now. And it might be a while, but what can we start doing right now? Or what have you guys started to do already? Um, and I will say again, I'm being more honest. Yes. Whether, and not caring how people take it. <laughs> like, 
this is what I want from you. <laughs> this is what I need. This is what your viewpoint looks like to me. Um, what, you know, how you react to it is of no concern to me. I, I'm done measuring myself. I'm done trying to, you know, I, I just want to be more honest. I need to be honest and not have to take care of somebody else's emotions and how they um, will take any of it, right? Um, so being more honest and again, creating that safe space to talk to people who are going through the same experiences and being able to say my, my truth and, and just not care, <laughs> just say what I need to say. Well, but also to be listened to, right? Right. And not be dismissed altogether. Right. Uh, and sometimes I feel like we scream louder when people choose not to listen. So then mm -hmm. that's kind of like how it gets worse. But what I'm hearing you say is that, because that was one of the talking points that we were going to get to next, is that you were setting and enforcing boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to encourage people to do this more often because, especially online, being honest and truthful about how you feel, especially let's put out an example. It's been happening all week for me. It's a lot of my, my uh, white friends specifically will post things like, Looting is not okay. Um, those are protests. Okay, well, when I, I'm going to ask you nicely to keep it at the word protest, please, for me, because I feel like you're just trying to make something amazing look horrible. And sure, there are horrible things happening, but when we nicely, nicely asked you uh, not to be a racist, you chose against it. So now, anyone who's taking this, like, neutral position is siding with the oppressor, essentially, to me. And so saying that very clearly to folks who've like worked with me, respect mm -hmm. me, and I respect them, it's like at this point, people keep dying. If it wasn't because people were dying, then it would be like, okay, well, we can handle this. There's still the option of fighting it. But no, we're just straight up killing people now. It's unacceptable. It's unacceptable, exactly. I think there's and a... Yeah, uh, I think there's a really big problem with institutional gaslighting, I would call it, you know, what everybody wants to call fake news nowadays, it's really just a rewording for propaganda. And we're just seeing a whole lot of news coverage that is simply false, simply completely politically loaded against anything that goes against the status quo. I think a good example I can bring up recently, I think it was in Minneapolis specifically, an uh, old white man, probably like in his 50s or 60s, he pulled up in an SUV towards one of the points of the protest. He gets out of his car and he starts aiming at the protesters with a bow and arrow. Mm. It's, it's really something that, you know, if, if I hadn't seen the video, I honestly might have not even believed it because it just sounded so absurd. So you see the video, he goes out, he brings out his bow and arrow, he starts aiming at people, he's about to shoot at people, and he starts screaming, all lives matter. And one of the protesters says, uh, you know, all lives mat won't matter until black lives matter. The tagline is going, getting really popular right now. And he just, uh, he just disagrees with it. I guess he just screams the same thing. And at one point, he's just attacked by a mob of protesters because, you know, if they don't attack him, he's going to shoot at them. Right. And afterwards, apparently, he was taken by police over to a hospital and he got all patched up and his car got flipped over and put on fire. Mm -hmm. Thing is, first, the police didn't even bother to arrest him, even though he was clearly out there with malicious yeah, intent and armed. And second, he showed up on a Fox News coverage where he alleged that he simply went out into a protest, screamed all lives matter, and that he was just beat up by a gang for mm. no mention whatsoever about him going out and shooting at people with a bow and arrow. Oh, they so, do this. They do he this. Said, he said it was too black. Say it again. <laughs> hmm? No, that guy said it was two black men in the video that when he recorded him, he said it was two black men that jumped him. And then the video later came out of him coming out of the car, bow and arrow, just shooting at people. I mean, mm. these people are sick. It's, it's 
insane. And, you know, Fox News, it's an institution. It's there's millions of people who watch Fox News every day, millions of people who rely on it for news. And this is the, the kind of message that they're sending to their viewership, a message that is simply false because it completely omits ex this extremely important information about everything that's going on. Well, to me, that just adds to the racial trauma because from a mental health standpoint, I know for a fact that if they're taking you to the hospital, it means that they're taking you to a mental health evaluation because you must not be okay. However, uh, we know that statistically, if you're darker, then they're just going to take you to the precinct. You're just going to go on down to the jail. And that's it. Uh, they'll book you. Um, and then that's that. And then we know also that a lot of people of color go without any type of psychiatric medication in prisons. Granted, they get abused a whole lot. I understand that. But there's also people who legitimately need it. <laughs> and they should be in a hospital. Uh, but because of the color of their skin, uh, they're sent to jail instead of for an evaluation, if you will. Um, and, I and, and then the message that I get from that is just like, well, then you don't matter. You just don't matter at all. You're not worthy. And you're always the criminal, not the victim. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the issue here. You see an actual criminal and he's white and I'm standing next to him. You're, you're going to think I'm the criminal before you ever thought that white person was. Um, and you give them the benefit of the doubt. Uh, you can take them to Burger King, give them water. <laughs> um, but that's not offered to anyone else. Even, you know, you can, yeah, it's just, there's just a lot of components here that we have to navigate through on top of just everyday things. And it's a lot of burden for any one person to have to deal with. I don't know if you guys do this, but when a particular situation affects a friend of yours, do you feel that it affects you too, even if you're not directly affected? Of course. Yeah, that's solidarity. Right. That, that's, that's one of the things that's been killing me because like, you know, I, I have a ton of friends from all of, well, you know, all backgrounds. That's how my city is. It's super diverse. And it's crazy. I'm seeing some of my Asian American friends, some of my Latino friends, you know what I mean? Some of my non like black friends that they, they, they're sharing stuff about looting, saying, oh, this discredits the movement. Um, and it's just like, you know, it's like, yo, bro, that could have been me. You know, we hang out together. We play sports together. We go to the club together. Like, you can't, you can't see me in that. You know, and it was kind of hurtful because it was like, damn, man, it, you know, the media, white supremacy, it's so ingrained in all of us, even me, you know, that, you know, they could look, they could look at somebody that looks like their friend and completely fall for the right wing messaging. You know? Yeah, I agree. And I, I'm also learning, um, unfortunately, I feel ashamed sometimes. Uh, my wife is uh, Chinese. And uh, she's been talking about, you know, prejudice against Asian Americans for a long time. And maybe I've dismissed it a little bit uh, because it's not as obvious. And, um, and yet uh, it happens. And uh, you know, Kevin yet. Hart. Yet. It's not as obvious yet. Obvious yet. Okay. Yeah. Well, to me. And, uh, and, and Kevin Hart uh, did a video the other day. He was talking about the incident in Central Park. And he said, the woman said to the, uh, the black man, he, she started out saying, you're black. And his point was that in our society, just that is a crime to a lot of people. Okay. And we, you know, there's a lot of people who fortunately are standing up and protesting. But too many people uh, that we know or in our society are pretending that this isn't happening. And, and, you know, rioting is like this negative thing. But, you know, if the Boston Bruins win the Stanley Cup, there'll be 800,000 people mm. in the streets. And they'll be yelling and screaming and throwing things. And yet, you know, there's no big deal about that. So, you know, our perception of, of what's right uh, 
you know, is, is very perverse. The way we, you know, our society sees people just because who you are could define, you know, your place in your station here. Good point. I remember the Red Sox nation flipping cars over and burning things because they won. That's okay, though. <laughs> They're just being themselves. They're having a little too much fun. They're, they were just kind of a little bit drunk. Or, or mm -hmm. the, one of the best things I heard this week is the protesters are drunk on the alcohol they looted. <laughs> Everybody's drunk? Huh. Interesting. So um, just because we have a little bit of time left already, uh, I just wanted to go over some of the um, recommendations for starting the process of healing, managing the healing. So that way we have some type of running chance. The reason I say this is because in order for us to enact any change, we're going to have to take care of ourselves and be uh, like lean, able-bodied even, like even what it means to me to be able to protect myself and stand in solidarity means physically improving myself, uh, mentally also taking care of myself. And so I, I want us to stir a little bit in the direction of how we've been taking care of ourselves, of each other. Uh, I know Adriana and I check in all the time. I, actually, I check in with most of you <laughs> all the time. Um, and thank you for doing that. And thank you for checking up on me too. You know that this is important. We've been, I've been inside for three months, two months. I don't, I don't know. Uh, and, and part of this healing, I feel like it's going to be as a collective to take radical responsibility for our actions, uh, recognize our own privilege. I have a lot of it, a lot of it. And even still we get all sorts of shit every single day. I can't imagine someone who is several shades darker than me or the hair is different or any, anything, or it lives in a different area than me. Okay. So I just want to recognize that I carry a lot of it with me. I also try to use it as much as possible. I know I, I get a seat at the table a lot of the times because of the way that I look. And then once I'm there, everyone's like, oh my God, why is she here? <laughs> Surprise. So um, other than that, it was enforcing and setting clear boundaries, which Adriana, I know you covered, having difficult conversations. A lot of people will avoid having a political conversation, but at the same time, if we don't have a conversation, how are we going to get to know each other? How are we going to get past this? How are we going to educate one another? Um, and so I think there's internal ways of doing that and external ways of doing that. Some of the internal ways is what we're doing again, having the group discussion. My favorite one that I found thanks to uh, Boston College that I do anyway, but I just, it's shocking to me to see an, a, an academic institution actually write it down, is to connect to our indigenous healing systems or our indigenous practices. And I know for me personally, that means to get a little more connected to some of the Cuban roots in my family and to take care of myself and, and to, get, to take care of myself and ask guides and use ancestral energy specifically uh, to drive this forward. And I don't know what that means to you guys, but I thought that was fascinating because every single culture that is represented here today has a different indigenous practice. So what do you guys think about that? Yo, honestly, I, I think that's huge because I'm, I'm Haitian American, you know, I'm first generation. And, uh, you know, you talk about uh, racial trauma you know, when the French colonized the island and, and you know, uh, tried to take away our Africanness, one of the things is they brainwashed the populations to think that voodoo and the traditional African uh, spiritualism that they practiced was evil. You know, even though it was the thing that gave the slaves the strength to fight for their freedom. And, you know, now I'm, I'm, I'm going back and I'm reading this stuff and it's, it's so weird for me as a black man to feel icky about something that gave my ancestors strength because colonialism says it's wrong and it's not it's not um and so i, I think there's something empowering about that um mm -hmm. especially um, for us to do for sure for sure and i'm not even talking about religion i'm talking about mm -hmm. just like indigenous healing systems okay a lot of our ancestors were using herbs and spices and just like different methods of, of handling things 
Uh, and to reconnect with that will give you that push forward. Um, anybody else want to comment on that one specifically? I, I was going to say that's the herbs. Um, I've been researching herbs and trying to grow them here at home. Um, my, you know, I grew up with my mother and my grandmother. Um, always having remedies with herbs. Mm -hmm. Everything was solved with that and, and it worked. And it was something that I didn't carry, unfortunately. I knew, I remember a couple of things, but everything else was just gone. And so connecting to that part also, it felt like I'm connecting to my grandmother and my mother in a new way. And that's been um, not healing, but it's been, it, it's, it's- It helps so, you carry through. Yeah, yeah. So, and as I said, you know, finding the safe spaces to talk with people, uh, that's been instrumental. Um, well, the other uh, internal healing recommendation is to watch what you read. Uh, I know it happens to me all the time. I'll be like sharing a bunch of articles and a bunch of things. And all of a sudden it's like, that's, that's actually a fake article. Whoops. That, and also this whole time, I don't know if you guys have noticed that some of us have been reading a lot more since we've been inside and right what a great time to educate ourselves in some bigger issues. So I, I've been encouraging people to read some of the classics, some, some big classics that relate to moments like these. Um, what are you guys reading? I, I, You're not reading right now. Okay. Well, I'm not reading exactly <laughs> right now, but um, I think of this as being uh, about being aware of history. A lot of people think this is the first time that we've ever had any kind of social unrest. They don't know about what happened in Tulsa 99 years mm -hmm. ago, okay? Where for 80 years, it was covered up. They don't know that in 1968, you know, the, the same thing happened in Watts and Detroit mm -hmm. and places like that. And, um, and, and so, I, I'll just take what you said and extend it a little bit. If we learn something important about what's happened uh, in the past or what, or what we could do, we need to share it with people. And uh, I think since the virus, a lot more people are obviously on social media and sharing things and maybe participating in, in stuff. And um, we can't forget about, uh, you know, we need to learn that we've never fixed anything in the past it's happening again okay so you know yeah i'm not reading as much but i'm trying to pay attention and uh and sharing what i learn uh you, you know a few people on this call i think everyone said something about listening and it's uh it's listening and learning um i know i have a long way to go um so yeah so I'm not reading as much, but hopefully I'm, I'm listening. What a, thank you for listening, Jeff. I know we just had a talk about that. <laughs> I had to, I had to, I'm sorry, I had to. See, learning. I see, learning. It, but thank you though, no, for real, for real. Um, what about external healing practices? So these are the things that we do that kind of like heal our soul, our, our mind. Um, which is kind of like for me what's been going nonstop, nonstop this whole time. It's like now more than ever, it's like now I can't give up and now I can't stop because you with the whole COVID thing, it was either we sit back and allow it to happen and just like, okay, let's just wait it out, or we or we push in and we press forward and I and I felt like I had to press forward and I feel like it's exhausting. It's exhausting. Um External healing, creative expression, movement and exercise, uh, any outdoor spaces. Any experiences with those, you guys? I'd like to follow what Jeff was talking about right now a bit. And I'd like to say that it is definitely very important to be both aware and critical of history. Right now, you know, a lot of people, just as you said, are thinking, oh no, this is the first time something like this happens. It might be the first time. Well, no, it's not even the first time in their lifetime. You know, Ferguson was just a few years ago. 
but a lot of people just don't see that for over a century now there's been international condemnation of the U.S. racial state of affairs. But some people will think, oh no, we live in a post-racial society. Or, oh no, there's no such thing. Or why would anybody talk about that? Why would anybody criticize that from outside? There's been criticism from inside and outside the United States for decades upon decades. And knowing this, helps us not just to understand our present position, our current conditions, but also to understand why it's so important to struggle against it. Because, you know, if our grandparents 60 years ago were going through the same discrimination, the same problems that racism causes, as we're going through today, all the more reason why we should be standing up and we should be organizing and we should be taking care of each other in the light of these conditions. Exactly. Mm. I'll be honest, um, taking care of myself is not something that I learned until I was like in a full on adult and I'm still learning. Um, I've been taught go like there's an issue just go go do something about it um your emotions save that for later but there was always later would come something else has happened so you never have that time to process anything um so i think that the other thing is learning learning about self-care and then learning what that means for you and that means discovering in most cases what that will mean for you I'll be honest with you, they made us write about it in grad school endlessly. And I thought it was ridiculous. I'm like, why are you making me write so much about this one issue that seems so simple? Like, yeah, well, you know, I watch some television and take it easy at night. Mm -hmm. well, that's actually not the definition of self-care whatsoever. Uh, I would actually like to read a particular self-care definition that I found, uh, again, from the Boston College Alumni Advisory Board. And they say that self-care is deliberate and should be self-initiated to promote and maintain overall wellness. Uh, these are, whether done in groups or individually, the key is to minimize negative intake of information, including social media outlets or discussion, in an effort to enhance personal well-being. Self-care should involve activities that bring some pleasure and promote healthy lifestyle to offset the effects of race-based stressors. Okay. Um, I mean, after that is when they go into the indigenous healing practices that they're, the, or, or healing systems, what they call it. Um, and their main recommendation in empowerment through resistance is to combat such feelings for uh, many. It's important to engage in activities that make them feel empowered and seek to promote change. I think that's why all five of us are here today is that this, this, this has the potential to, to cause some type of change, even if it's just a conversation or like, oh, look at them just talking about this. Either way, now the word racial trauma is, is a little bit more out there and it is intense. Um, they also recommend, because they go into how your body holds this trauma, your body will always keep the score. I say this all the time. It comes from a book from um, Dr. Basil van der Kolk I don't like him personally, but he has great recommendations. So we, so we're going to listen to that part. And it really, it is cumulative. Okay. It, it will add up in your body as disease, as mental illness, stress, heart conditions, blood pressure, diabetes, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, their recommendation at the end of everything uh, other than like healthy exercise and diet, which I think you can even incorporate the indigenous healing systems into your exercise practices and specifically your diet. Um, they say uh, it's also important to stay connected to family, friends, and community, neighborhoods, and spiritual communities for shared wisdom, support, and collective strength. Finally, they say participation in protests with community and family is one way to cope and support one another through connection, solidarity, and strength across generations. I've been getting phone calls nonstop today of people asking if they can bring their children to the protest. And the answer right now, I don't know if you guys agree or not, but to me, it's a big fat no. Right now. Right now. Today. Yeah. It's a no. 
but it's mostly young people protesting as well. So it's just uh, kind of a catch-22. And, and how, I know my role models growing up, all my teachers are the front line of protests, all of them. So shout out to the teachers at Wesleyan Academy in Guaynao, Puerto Rico, <laughs> um, for being that, that type of role model for me because I saw it growing up and therefore I knew that when I was in a position to do it, I would. I don't know if you guys have had a conversation with your kids or if that's come up at all, but we've had a lot of comments and questions about that lately on Facebook. Uh, I think it's really important I mean, to keep kids safe. Right now, there's just so much violence going on, the rubber bullets, the tear gas, and this is, these are things that have happened in protests historically be it now, be it 10 years back, whatever. And it's really, I think it's really dangerous to just expose children like this. It's important for children to know what's going on, but mm -hmm. to take them and expose them to that sort of situation, I, I, really, I think it's a bit reckless. I mean, they're watching the videos. They're watching not just the videos of the protest, but the other day a friend of mine called me crying because her daughter had just seen the video of George Floyd, uh, mm -hmm. the full video of George Floyd. And so she didn't even know what to say to her daughter. It's like, you know, how, how, how did we even get here? Mm -hmm. and, and how does a child of color interpret these messages? Mm -hmm. We literally have about five more minutes to go. Uh, any other important, I, I covered pretty much everything that I want to say. I know we also had done a podcast on creative expression about around this, the role of artwork in your expression or even your resistance, right? The way that you express your resistance can be online. It can be in person. There's so many, so many ways. Wear a mask, <laughs> whatever you do, please wear a mask. Uh, any other closing thought questions or concerns? I think it's just important that people understand it's okay to feel what you feel whatever you're feeling <laughs> and do not seek validation in anyone else for those feelings they're valid um they're yours um and need to be respected yep nobody can tell you how you feel mm -hmm. right community is very important a community of people who share you know your ideas your struggles because you know if we're just going to be bombarded by institutional gaslighting we're not going to be able to recognize what our situations are and what we're going through but by having communities of people who do share our lived experiences that way we can understand what we're going through only by understanding our issues can we really resolve them and thank you for being the guy who creates a lot of those communities especially in puerto rico and the diaspora that's you <laughs> you create a lot of community and that's how I met you. <laughs> I'd like to just uh, express my gratitude to be on a call with uh, my old friends Jen and Marvin and my new friends Adriana and Juan and stay safe. But I think we need to be assertive. And um, too many people uh, will tell you, uh, even people that you respect their ideas, that we've come so far. Mm -hmm. And uh, if this doesn't prove that we have an unbelievable effing far to go. Um, we, are, we are nowhere where we need to be. And, uh, and we need to be always maintaining that and not let people tell us otherwise. But I wanna stay, say, stay safe to every one of you. Thank you, Jeff, for always being an ally. Accomplice. Accomplice, that's right, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> no allies. You're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. You're right. Hey, what about like, Marvin? Right, Marvin? Closing remarks. Yeah, for real. <laughs> Thank you, gang. Thank you, Marvin. <laughs> Just for being here, even still, and talking about your experience. So, um, mm. yes, exactly. Thank you guys for being here. If we feel like we loved it, we can do it again. Let me know what you think comments below i don't know let's do the whole youtube thing uh subscribe or whatever i don't know i don't know uh, thank you so much you guys you guys are amazing and i feel safer in the world because you're here
Thank you. Thank you for doing this.